Good morning, beautiful church. I just want to call Pastor Jeff and the worship team out because it's not fair for them to make me cry before I have to come up here. So, <laughs> but it's a, it's a good cry. Um, our word for today is from Luke chapter 18, 9 through 14. It's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Uh, then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly, certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you this, sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Greta. Well, good morning, church. I have spent the week doing my wife's honeydew list. Are you ready for winter? I painted the front steps of the uh, parsonage yesterday. I can't hardly stand up straight after that. I've been doing all the work that she would like to get done outside. And I was thinking about my ego. Because she has me doing some pretty nasty things. And it's like, I'm the pastor. I shouldn't have to be doing these things. But for 47 years, Deb has put me in my place to make sure that I understand that I am only a child of God. Check your ego at the door. Will you pray with me? This morning, Lord, we come with egos. We come with pride. We come with, with a worldliness in our hearts. So help us, Lord, today to be humble, to hear the words of Scripture, to hear the message you have for us this day. Lord, I pray the words that I share will be lifted up with honor and with glory to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ego and humility seem to be at total odds in the world today. So did you hear about the minister who said he had a wonderful sermon on humility, but he was waiting for a much larger audience before he preached it? Kind of gets in the way sometimes, doesn't it? Our scripture last week dealt with prayer. We talked about persistent prayer continually being in prayer and in an attitude of prayer in all that we do. Well, today Jesus follows that story and He teaches us how we are to come to God in prayer. We must come with an attitude of humility. We must overcome our ego and our pride to humbly come before God. So the question this morning is, do you believe in prayer? How many of you believe in prayer? Well, a tale is told about a small town that historically had been dry. No alcohol had ever been sold in this small town. But then a local businessman decided to build a tavern. A group of Christians from the local church were concerned and planned an all-night prayer meeting to ask God to intervene in this upcoming tavern. Well, it just so happened that shortly after that meeting, lightning struck the bar and it burned to the ground. 
the owner sued the church claiming that the prayers of the congregation were responsible for the fire. The church hired a lawyer to argue in court that they were not responsible for that fire. The presiding judge, after his initial review of the case, stated, no matter how this case comes out, one thing is clear. The tavern owner believes in prayer, and the Christians do not. We finished a, a couple weeks ago a series entitled Leading Generous Lives, and we talked about checking our attitudes as we look at the essence of who we are. Today we're talking about checking our attitude as we come before God in prayer. In Luke's Gospel today, Jesus tells the story of two men who went to the temple to pray. Two men whose life and lifestyle was totally opposite. One was a very religious, pious man. He followed the law of the Old Testament, the Torah. He fasted twice a week. He tithed of all of his income. And he tells us of his virtues and all of his godliness. But one of his faults lies in his attitude before God. We see that the Pharisee prays in the temple. And the Pharisee stands apart from all others. He separates himself from all others. He does this based on his perception that he was better than all the other sinners in that building. Now before we condemn this man as being wicked and evil, we have to look at our own lives. We ask the difficult question, do I carry some attitude, some attitudes about others in my heart? Can I honestly say there isn't a part of me that has a little attitude in my heart that is much like the Pharisee. I don't do those things. I am better than that. How could they even think? And suddenly our attitude puts us in the place of the Pharisee. Have we ever thought a little more of ourselves than we should? This Pharisee has an ego. And his ego publicly gets in the way of a meaningful prayer. As you listen to the prayer of the Pharisee, listen for his attitude. He prayed, I thank you that I am not like that tax collector over there. I fast two days a week. I give you one-tenth of all my income. Did you hear the prayer of the Pharisee? I, I, I. Four times he used the word I in his prayer. There is no lifting of an adoration to God, no confession of his sins, no supplication or asking for healing for others. He does give a prayer of thanksgiving. Did you hear that? He prays, I thank you that I am not like the others. It's a very self-centered prayer. And it was not pleasing to God. It's a prayer that looks down upon others. The Pharisee's prayer is a prayer that's meant to be heard by others, not necessarily God. He wanted others to know how religious he was, how important he was. We hear the proud ego of the Pharisee recited in his prayer. Lest we condemn him, there were 12 men that followed Jesus, the disciples, the apostles. And the disciples struggled with an attitude 
as well. In Mark 10, we're given the account of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, asking Jesus to allow them the place of honor in the kingdom of God. You remember they asked, may we be seated on your right and on your left. May we have the place of honor when we enter the kingdom of God. The other disciples hear this and they're indignant. Why? Because they want a place of honor as well. The very people Jesus chose to change the world had an attitude that needed to be adjusted. And Jesus tells them, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. A revolution of what the disciples were thinking. We're following Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, the King who has come to set us free. Not this servant. Not someone who would give their life for another. Not someone who would allow themselves to be beaten, arrested, tortured, and killed. We want to be first in the kingdom of God. Leonard Bernstein, the late conductor of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, was once asked to name the most difficult instrument to play. Without hesitation, he replied, the second fiddle. I can get plenty of people to play first violinist, but to find someone who can play second fiddle with enthusiasm, that's a problem. And if we have no second fiddle, we have no harmony. It's a powerful statement, isn't it? How many of us are willing to play second fiddle? to do the work of the church that no one ever sees, to step out and minister to the homeless, to the lost, to our brothers and sisters, and not get credit for it. Jesus said to be my disciple, you need to play the second fiddle. You need to, to be my hands and my feet in every way and every place of ministry. The Pharisee could not check his ego at the door. It came in with him. And he prayed publicly. And God did not receive his prayer. But it says the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not raise his face to God because he felt unworthy to be in the presence of God. This tax collector, this sinful man, came to pray with the proper attitude. And he prayed, God have pity on me, a sinner. Now I came across the prayer this week that may reveal what is truly in our hearts. The prayer goes, so far today, God, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or self-indignant. And I'm really glad about that, Lord. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. <laughs> and from then on, I'm probably going to need a lot more we begin with good intentions, but without persistently being in the presence of God, we fall and we fail. Two men went to the temple to pray, but only one went away with a blessing from God. Two attitudes were presented in prayer, but only one was acceptable to God. 
Dwight L. Moody put it this way, when we bow in prayer, God sends no one away empty except for those who are full of themselves. Lord, help us to be humble. When you approach God in prayer, what is the attitude of your heart? I remember back years ago when I was the pastor in Huron, South Dakota at the Riverview Church. I got a call one afternoon to go to Dale and Karen Carter's home. And I stood in the living room with Karen as Dale, her husband, arrived home. Dale is a big, burly guy. He's not an educated man. He drove the feed truck, but he had his heart as big as the world. And as Dale arrived home from work, Karen had to break the news to him that his son Kenny had been killed in a car accident in Kentucky. I embraced Dale. His knees buckled and tears poured down his cheeks. And he sat down for a few moments with his head low. And then he looked up and he looked into my eyes and he said, Pastor, will you take me to the church to pray? So I took Dale to the church. There was no one there. And we went in and we knelt at the altar. And we knelt there for as long as Dale wanted to pray. I listened to Dale's prayer and I wept with Dale. I was deeply touched by his humility. Here was a man who had just lost his son in a tragic accident who is now kneeling at the altar praising God for the blessings that God had given him in life. He was thanking God for the gift of his son, Kenny, and for all that they had had together for the time they had. As we left the church, Dale looked at me and he said, Reverend, it's going to be okay. And he said with a smile on his face, can we talk about Kenny? And so we sat and we talked for a good long while about his son, Kenny. You see, Dale chose in the deepest broken moment of life to come to the altar of grace, to come to the cross of Christ and pray. Not a prayer of woe is me, but a prayer of adoration and grace that God had given him, Kenny, for the years that he had. I never forget that because Dale was a simple man. He wasn't a scholar. He didn't understand a lot of things. But he understood how much God loved him and how much God had given him. Jesus said, for everyone who makes himself great will be humble, and everyone who humbles himself will be made great. John Flavel said, they that know God will be humble, and they that know themselves cannot be proud. Two men went to the temple to pray, and only one was made right with God. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul said, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Who am I to put myself above anyone else in God's kingdom? Here I am, Lord. Send me. We must come before God as broken, as sinful people. We must come before God not with an, an ego that I have done well, but with a humility that I need You, Lord, in every place, in every area, in every moment of my life. As we approach the throne of grace, May we examine the attitude of our heart. 
And may we enter into prayer with a humble spirit. So I leave you with the question, how does your prayer life measure up? May our prayer be, Lord, may I be humble that I might be used by You. Lord, may I be humble that I might hear Your voice and that I might be Your hands. Whether it be in a public setting or in a private place, Lord, may I be humble before the One who has given me life. Check your ego at the door. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, the world seems to be filled with many, many egos. We want it our way. We think we know the best. I am better than this. Or why are they like the way they are? Lord, break our hearts that we might see one another in the love of Jesus Christ. Humble us that we may come before you, that our prayers may be heard. Amen and amen. Would you stand with us? Difficult message this morning, isn't it? Check your ego at the door. Pastor Barry has to check his ego too. You know, I look out among the saints and I see the hearts of Christ in so many of you. And I deeply thank you for your ministry and for your willingness to be the hands of Christ. You don't always get a pat on the back, you don't always, you are not always seen. But the Spirit is at work. The Spirit is alive in this body of Christ. Go forth to humbly serve the Lord. Amen.